So um, good morning. Um, thanks, Aaron. You set this up really nicely. I think we definitely need to to work to get on some of these issues. I think we we share a lot of lot in common in terms of what we're interested in. So what I want to do today, like Aaron said, I'm going to get a little bit more into the weeds to better explain the association between weather, weather extremes, and disease development. And I'm gonna use Jabrella Irat as an example for obvious reasons based on the questions I've had even before the session started. Um, this has been a problem in the state in 2020. It was a problem in 2020. It has been a problem that's been increasing in frequency over the last several years. When I first came here to Ohio State in 2003, I would say, Jabrella, Arad, and vomitoxin and corn, they occurred every seven years or so. I think now we're seeing more frequent occurrences of these um, two problems um, at a frequency of about two to three years now. And obviously it begs the question, um, what weather has to do with this? And weather has a lot to do with it, as I'll show you in my next couple of slides. So I'll focus my attention heavily on Jabrella, Arad, but what I want to do is stick a pin here to say that some of the things I talk about as it relates to Jabrella Erat uh, relates to other diseases as well. I can't talk about all the diseases here in one presentation, but the general story still applies, as Aaron mentioned, weather patterns changing affects diseases in multiple ways. It favors some diseases and makes some diseases less frequent, but I'll focus on Jabrella Erat today. It's hard to think about weather and its effect on disease without getting back to basics. And by getting back to basics, I mean the disease triangle. The disease triangle in plant pathology, this is one of the very first things we teach a student coming to take a class in plant pathology. For you to have disease development, you need to have a susceptible host, a crop that's susceptible to the pathogen that's, that's in the field, the fungus or the bacteria or the virus in the field. You need to have that pathogen at a certain population level that can infect that crop and cause problems, and you need to have the right weather conditions. So that's the very basic idea behind the disease triangle. Now I'm gonna take a slightly different look at the disease triangle today by looking more at the interaction um, among these three pieces. Because weather not only affects disease, how it affects disease, depending on how it affects growth and development of the crop. Like Aaron mentioned, once you've got these weather extremes, then it's gonna affect the growth and development of the crop. And by virtue of its effect on the growth and development of the crop, it can make that crop susceptible for a longer period or less susceptible depending on the disease. And that's what I'm gonna focus on today. The, the, the effect of weather conditions on the window of susceptibility to a certain disease, and in this case, Jabrella Arad. I'll also focus on the, the effect of weather on spore production and crop residue. We've got lots of fields planted, no till or minimum tillage, and weather conditions can affect how much spores are produced and how long spores are produced during the growing season. And the coincidence of spore production and that window susceptibility, dining interaction, can affect how much disease you have and how much mycotoxin contamination you've got in the grain. But this is a general story that applies to all diseases. Now let's focus a little bit more on Gibrella era. Typical symptoms would be pinkish, whitish mold growing towards the tip of the air. This is because the fungus infects via the silk channel. And the fungus is called Fusarium graminearum. It's also called Jabrella Z. And I know I've had people ask questions about, is this Fusarium aerat because the fungus is called Fusarium? It's not. Fusarium aerat is different. It's caused by different species of Fusarium. I know plant pathologists can make things a little complicated sometimes. This is called Jabrella erat because it's caused by the fungus Jabrella zea, which is also called Fusarium griminiarum. And don't ask me why, sometimes we give these fungi two different names. Typical symptoms, again, pinkish white mold growing towards the tip of the air. Once those airs, those kernels are badly affected, then they become shriveled, lightweight, and you've got a reduction in grain yield in terms of bushels per area. You also have a reduction in test weight because those kernels are light shriveled and lightweight because the fungus sucks all the nutrients out of them. The biggest problem with this disease though is contamination of grain with mycotoxins. And specifically, we're gonna focus on vomitoxin today, bearing in mind that other mycotoxins could be involved, but vomitoxin is the one that's most frequent and the, ones we're, the one we're most, most concerned about in most years. That is because um, vomitoxin 
increases threefold in DDGs during ethanol production. DDGs are a co-product of ethanol production that's used as a, a nutrient-rich um, source of energy, source of food for animals, source of um, ration for animals. And if you've got grain contaminated with vomitoxin, because that vomitoxin is not lost during the ethanol production process, or it does not concentrate in the ethanol itself, it rather it's concentrated in that one third of the grain that goes into making DDGs, DDGs can have three times more vomitoxin in the grain than DDGs can have three times more the vomitoxin than you had in the original grain, and that's a concern. Because of this, ethanol plants, depending on the level of vomitoxin, the grain might be priced down or may be completely rejected, and that's a concern from, a, from an economic standpoint for growers. This is because if, you, if animals consume grain with high levels of vomitoxin or DDGs with high level of vomitoxin, monogastric animals, swine in particular, are particularly sensitive to vomitoxin. It causes vomiting and feed refusal. So obviously it is a concern and again, 2020, it definitely was a big issue. It continues to be a big issue in the state. So I'm gonna cover here today, what can we do in terms of our understanding of how wet affects this disease, how we can think about management and, and tools that can be, helped, can be used to help with management decisions. So the big question is, why the increase in Jabrella ERAT and vomitoxin over the last 10 to 15 years? And it takes us back to the disease triangle. Like I said, for you to have a disease, you need to have a susceptible crop, you need to have pathogen that's aggressive, and you need to have the favorable environmental conditions. So it has to be one of these three or all three of these factors contributing to higher levels of Gibraltar ERAT and vomitoxin over the last 10 to 15 years. What we did over a four year period, one of my graduate students, we collected samples, over 600 samples, and we took a closer look at the pathogen population. And what we found is that the fungus that causes Gibrella ERAT, the pathogen population hasn't changed considerably over this period. The same we've got, I'm not gonna get into the details here, but we've got different um, type, what we call chemotypes of the fungus. The chemotype that's present in Ohio is still the same that was present 15 years ago. So basically there hasn't been a change in terms of the vomitoxin producing ability of the fungus. We know based on our survey that we've got lots of susceptible hybrids out there. So hybrid susceptibility is definitely playing a role. But what we suspect is the big player based on information Aaron presented to us and our own observations is that weather is probably the single most important driver of higher levels of Gibrella ERAT and vomitoxin over the last 10 to 15 years. What we did is summarize weather data from the OERDC weather station across um, six different Ohio um, counties. We summarized weather during the period from 85 to uh, 94, 95 to 2004, 2005 to 2014, and then the next summary is gonna be from 2015 to um, um, 2024. But if you look at the data, look at the black bars, in Wayne County, Wood County in particular, and Sandusky County, the northernmost counties, we had more days during the growing season, this is during the corn growing season, we had more days with two inches, with more than two inches of rain during the last 10 years of that 30-year um, period. Between 2005 and 2014, in Wayne, Wood, and Sandusky County, counties, we had more days with more than two inches of rain during the last um, 10 years of that uh, 30 year period. And it went progressively that way between um, 85 and 94, 95 and 2004. So progressively over the last 10 to 20 years, we've had more days with more than two inches of rain during the growing season. Similar trend was observed in Clark County during the last 20 years. The 20 years from 2005 to uh, 2014, had more days with more than two inches of rain compared to the first 10 years of that period. So definitely rainfall or moisture provided by rainfall seems to be playing a role in terms of higher levels of Gerella erat and vomitoxin in corn over the last decade or so. So let's take a closer look at what we found 
over the last four, uh, four years between 2015 and 2018. This is some work done by my students. And what we did here is look closer at vomitoxin levels in grain, naturally infected grain. We looked at vomitoxin levels in grain between 2015 and 2018. Each set of bars there shows 2015, 16, 17, and 18. And we've got vomitoxin in samples collected over those four years. And what we observe is in 2016 and 2018, over 75%, close to 80% of the samples had detectable levels of vomitoxin in 2016 and 2018. In 2015, we basically did not detect any vomitoxin, but in 2016 and 18, we detect high levels of vomitoxin. About uh, 40 to 45% of those samples had vomitoxin between one and five parts per million. And then about 30% of the samples, sorry, about 20% of the samples had vomitoxin greater than five parts per million in 2016 and 2018. 2017 was intermediate. We then looked at vomitoxin levels in ears that look pretty healthy. In other words, we collected samples from ears that did not have visual symptoms of Gibrella era. So it did not have mold. The ears did not look moldy. And we again sampled and looked for vomitoxin in those ears that looked healthy. Again, in 2016, about 80% of those samples had detectable levels of vomitoxin, even though we did not see mold on the ears. About 30% uh, of those had uh, vomitoxin between one and five parts per million. And about 5% had greater than five parts per million. Similar trend in 2018, where about 60% of the samples had detectable levels of vomitoxin, and then about 10% of the samples had vomitoxin between one and five parts per million. So clearly there was something different between 2016 and 2015, or between 2016 and 18, and 2015 and 17. So we took a closer look at the weather conditions during the growing season, across those four years. What we did, we summarized rainfall for the month after silting. So we collected weather data. We had weather stations set up at these locations. And these are, lo these are the corn performance trial locations. And we collected weather data, rainfall in particular, between silking and 30 days after silking. And what we observed was in 2015, if we looked at the number of hours during that 30 days with some rain, we only had about 22 hours with some rain during that 30-day period. Compared to 2016, we had 48 hours with rain during that 30-day um, 30 period um, from silking to 30 days after silking. Similarly, in 2018, we had about 50 days with some rain, with, sorry, 50 hours. This is hours here, 50 hours of rain during that 30-day um, period. If we look at total precipitation in 2015, we had about 22 inches of rain during a 30-day period compared to 42 inches in 2016 and 45 inches in 2018. 2017 was intermediate. So clearly the association with vomitoxin we observe here was associated with our rainfall during that window of a month after silking and it's associated with higher uh, precipitation and more frequent precipitation. So we then asked why is this association between rainfall or precipitation or weather condition or weather extremes and Gibrella era? To answer that question, we take a closer look at the crop because like I said, weather does not only affect the disease, it affects the crop, and it affects the disease and the crop interaction. So tasseling and silking, pollen shed, typically occurs early in the morning or late in the afternoon when conditions are cool and um, humid. And pollen shed can, can occur over a, um, a, a one-week period. The window of pollen shed can be increased or decreased depending on the weather conditions. If it gets hot and dry, then pollen shed can occur over a shorter period, one or two days, if, it's, if it gets hot and dry. If it stays cool and wet, then it, it can occur over one week period or even more than a week if conditions stay cool and wet. Silking, under cool wet conditions, silk emerges at a rate of about an inch to an inch and a half per day. 
again, if conditions get hot and dry, the silk can dry out. The silk still emerges, but it can dry out and it's not as receptive to pollen in terms of pollination and grain fill. Why is this important? Well, the fungus that causes gibberella air rot and produce vomitoxin enters the air via the silks. Those spores land on the silk and they hitch a ride with the pollen, grow down the silk into the ovaries where they infect, grow and produce mycotoxins. So optimum conditions for pollination and silk elongation also favor infection by the fungus. So if you've got weather conditions that cause pollination and silking to occur over a longer period, there's a greater likelihood that spores can land on those spikes during that time, leading to infection and gibberella air rat development. Hence our idea of looking at weather summaries during silking to see exactly how weather summaries during silking affects disease development, because it affects the, the length of that window of susceptibility to infection and again, could affect the coincidence of favorable weather with spore production and infection. Weather conditions also affect spore production and crop residue. Here we've got a wheat spike, uh, wheat stubble showing spores being produced. Remember the fungus that causes head scab is the same fungus that causes gibberella air rot in corn. So if you've got wheat stubble in the field and you've got these stubble producing these black resting spore structures, rainfall and high relative humidity favor spore production and maturation. So if you've got these stubble in the field, you've got extended periods of rainfall, you've got conditions favorable for spore production, and the longer the rain persists, you've got more spores being produced over a wider window more time. Those spores are produced in residue and those spores have to be released from residue into the air to infect silks. Spore release is favored by dry conditions, relatively dry conditions during the day and warm and humid, cool conditions in the evenings. You may recall I talked about warm, um, sorry, cool, humid conditions favoring pollen shed and silking. So basically the same set of conditions that favor pollen shed and silking also favor spore release from crop residue in the field. Rainfall and high relative humidity are important for spore production and maturation, and spore release from crop residue in the field are favored by cool, wet conditions in the evening, the same conditions that are favor pollen shed and um, silk elongation. So if you've got coincidence of conditions favorable for spore production, pollen shed, and uh, silk elongation, you've got the perfect storm for infection and gibberella air rat development. Our production system is one where we plant a lot of no-till corn, no-till soybeans, or um, minimum till situations. The fungus infects corn. It infects wheat, causing head scab. It causes stock rot and ear rot in corn. And it causes seedling diseases in soybean. So we've always got conditions favorable for the fungus to survive in crop residue in the field. Like I said, we've got lots of hybrids planted out there that's a, that are susceptible. So if we've got the perfect weather conditions that results in spore production, that result in silking occurring and coinciding with spore production, we've got the perfect storm for gibberella air rat development and vomit toxin contamination of the grain. If silking, if pollen shed, silk elongation and spore production and crop residue, all favored by a similar set of weather conditions, if those coincide in a field in a given year, then we've got the perfect storm for gibberella air rat development. And that's probably what we've been seeing over the last several years. We've got conditions favorable for all three of these processes, hence more disease and more vomit toxin in the grain. So the big question always is, what do I do? We've got weather conditions likely favoring disease. We gotta keep thinking about management. And my first line of defense, obviously you can't do anything about this year's disease because the season is already over. But as you plan moving forward, resistance, resistance, resistance. That's the first and best line of defense. As far as I know, there's no extra cost to planting a hybrid that's resistant to this disease. No hybrid is immune, but some hybrids get more disease than other hybrids. So you wanna choose the best resistant hybrids. And more importantly, 
seed companies have to breed for resistance to this disease. It's increasing in prevalence, it's increasing in frequency, not only in Ohio, and attention has to be given to breeding for resistance to this disease. That's our first and best line of defense. There's a couple of different types of resistance. Resistance to silk infection. Remember the fungus enters via the silk. And if the, if the hybrid has some resistance to silk infection, then it's gonna limit or reduce the colonization of the spread of, of the silks, which is a big step in terms of reducing disease and vomitoxin in the grain. We've got resistance to coronal infection. Once the silk is infected and, and the um, fungus grows into the ovaries, it can spread from coronal to coronal. If the hybrid has some resistance to coronal infection, then it can reduce the spread from one coronal to the next. Again, this is another type of resistance that companies are gonna have to breed for to help reduce this problem over the next um, few years. Another possible type of resistance based on our, our observations in the field could be resistance to vomitoxin contamination. Some hybrids, even though they might have similar levels of disease, some hybrids would have less vomitoxin based on our observation. For example, you might have two hybrids. One has 5% of the ear damage with mold. The other hybrid have the same 5%, has the same 5% of the ear damage with mold. That one hybrid might have two parts per million vomitoxin. The other one might have five parts per million vomitoxin. So there it's quite possible that some hybrids are more resistant to vomitoxin contamination. Again, companies gonna have to breed and select for hybrids with resistance to vomitoxin if that actually does exist. BT events help because BT reduces, BT events help to reduce insect feeding. It helps with the problem, but does not solve the problem. Even if there's no insect damage on the ears, the fungus can enter via the silk channel. And even if you've got a BT hybrid, if conditions are right, the fungus can still enter the fire of the ear. So BT can help to reduce insect damage, which also can make the problem worse, but BT does not solve the problem. With Fusarium aerat, I'm not gonna cover that a whole lot today, BT helps because Fusarium aerat depends on damage made by insect to enter into the ear. Fungicide is an option. I had that question pop up early on. Um, Prothioconazole, which is uh, the active ingredient in proline is the best fungicide we've seen in terms of Jabrella ARAT control. Results are not very consistent. Results are what I would call iffy. That lots of variation within an experiment, lots of the variation between experiments, but at this point, this is the best option we've got in terms of fungicide for Jabrella ARAT control. It has to be applied at R1, that's that silking growth stage, because that's when the infection occurs, so you wanna get that fungicide on. And I think one of the big problems with effective control with fungicide is if you, you're flying over the top or you're using high clearance sprayers, it's hard to get that fungicide down to the height of the ear to the silks to protect those silks. Fungicide is an option, but again, it's not very consistent. It's not very reliable until such time that we understand the application technology that needs to be used to improve fungicide efficacy. Other management practice, these are management practices after the fact. You've got Jabrella aerat in your field. You wanna harvest grain early and handle grain separately. Handle grain from disease fields separately from grain from healthy fields. You wanna just combine to, to blow out fines and small shriveled lightweight kernels. Fines and small shriveled lightweight kernels are often more contaminated with vomitoxin. So you wanna blow those out to reduce vomitoxin in storage and to reduce the level of vomitoxin overall. Um, before storing grain, you wanna test for vomitoxin. And I wanna take the opportunity here to, um, to make, make it clear because I've had questions based on one of my newsletter articles. The test for vomitoxin, quick test for vomitoxin is very different from tests for other toxins such as aflatoxin and fumonacins. If you've got a test kit for aflatoxin, it's not gonna work for vomitoxin. If you've got a test kit for fumonacin, it's not gonna work for vomitoxin. The test kit has to be specific for vomitoxin. So before you store grain, you wanna test to see exactly what levels of vomitoxin you've got going into storage so that you can make the right decisions in terms of storing grain on the cool, moist, cool dry conditions to reduce for the fungal growth and vomitoxin contamination storage. You wanna reduce moisture to 15% or below 
and you want to keep temperatures cool between low 30s and up, upper 40s. Storage conditions are not going to get rid of amitoxin, but what it's going to do is prevent forward, forward of amitoxin for the fungal growth and vomitoxin contamination stories. Now, if you look at all of these recommendations, these are recommendations that are contrary to the normal harvest practice. You typically harvest grain after it dries in the field because it reduces drying cost. If you harvest grain early, then it's likely harvested at a higher moisture content, and there's a cost associated with, with drying. And you have to make that decision without knowing exactly how much vomitoxin you're going to get. Adjusting combine to reduce the blowout fines or to reduce um, shriveled lightweight kernels, is all, there's also a cost associated with that. That can slow up harvest operation. It can also result in healthy kernels being blown, blown, blown out, reducing your overall yield. There's a cost associated with investing in test kits. So these are all decisions that we're recommending to help with reducing vomitoxin from fields that have gibberella ARAC, but there's cost associated with drying there's cost associated with testing. So what we wanted to do is use the weather-based information or understanding of how weather affects Gibrella ARAC to come up with tools that can help with making some of these decisions. And the first step is scout fields. If you scout fields and you quantify Gibrella ARAC in the field, then you can use that information to estimate the level of vomitoxin contamination in the grain. We did that with our data and found that we can use Gibrella ARAT severity, how much disease you've got in the field, to predict the risk of grain contamination with more than one part per million vomitoxin with an accuracy of 87%. The challenge here, though, is quantifying Gibrella ARAT in the field. Unlike leaf diseases where you can walk plots and look at leaves and see exactly what you've got, for Gibrella ARAT, you're going to have to go into that field, peel back husk, and look at individual ears to quantify that disease. So it can be pretty tedious, but it can work if you actually quantify disease in the field. The next problem is getting a large enough sample to be representative of your field. But again, it's an option to help. If you know how much Gibrella air rot you've got, then you can estimate the risk of vomitoxin exceeding one part per million, and it can help with making decisions as to whether you harvest early, whether you prepare to dry grain, um, to spend money on drying cost or spend money on microtoxin testing. The other approach is use our understanding of the weather variables. I've, I've broken down all the different association between weather and silking and spore production. We got a better understanding of these associations. We can use that to use weather-based models to predict the risk of amitoxin to help with some of those decision-making. We collected data over 40 environments, four years, 10 locations, 15 hybrids, and then we looked at 10 naturally infected here per, per, per hybrid. We quantify vomitoxin levels, and then we collect weather data. And we look at the association between weather data and Gibrella era severity. So what we did, we summarized weather data over periods before silking, over periods after silking, five days, 10 days, 15 days, on both sides of silking, and then we look at average number of hours of weather within a certain range, nighttime and daytime. As Aaron mentioned, sometimes the average doesn't tell the whole story. We want to look at nighttime patterns, daytime patterns, and duration, how many hours the crop was subject subjected to a certain temperature and moisture condition. We use that information, and then we predict vomitoxin levels in the grain. With our models, we were able to use temperature, relative humidity, rainfall, and wetness variables to predict vomitoxin in the grain with over 80% accuracy. Of the variables we summarized, we observed that conditions between seven days after silking and 21 days after silking had the strongest relationship with vomitoxin in the grain. Conditions during that 15-day period between seven days after silking and 21 days after silking were the strongest predictors of vomitoxin in the grain. And of these predictors, temperature between 59 degrees Fahrenheit and 86 degrees Fahrenheit in association with relative humidity greater than 80% was the strongest predictor of vomitoxin in the grain. We also had some models that predict vomitoxin in the grain very well with relative humidity greater than 90% and temperature greater than 86%. 
I'm not getting into all the different models we looked at here, but what I want to give you guys is a snapshot that we can, once we understand the association between weather, weather patterns, weather extreme, and in this case, at specific time during the growing season, we can predict vomitoxin levels in the grain, and we can generate tools that you guys can use to help make management decisions. Ultimately, what we want to do is develop a forecasting system just like this one that we have for HeadScab, where you can look at a map and say, my risk is high, my risk is low, I need to apply a fungicide, or I need to harvest grain early. You can make those decisions based on risk of disease development. Remember, there's cost associated with these decisions. So if you have a tool that can help you to more inform, to make more informed decisions, it can help with making fungicide application decisions as we improve fungicide application technology or make decisions about harvesting grain early. We can make grain handling and grain storage decisions. We can make decisions about buying test kit for mycotoxin analysis. So before I finish up, I want to acknowledge um, the Hawaii Corn and Wheat Growers Association. They have provided resources for most of my Jabella ARAT research, provided funding for my graduate student, Felipe. He's the one in the picture here. The um, USDA NIFA, the IPM grant, providing, provided funding for weather monitoring, purchase of the weather stations that we use. And the Bayer Crop Science provided some report resources to help with salaries for my students. So that's all I've got. Hopefully you got a chance using one disease as, a, as an example, get a sense for how weather and weather extremes affect disease development and how we can use that, this, that, that information or knowledge and understanding of these relationships to develop tools that can help with disease management. Develop Thank you. Rat. The, the questions about fungicide for ear rats in general is pretty much the same. Um, trials always pretty, do a pretty good job of controlling them if you can get that fungicide on the target. Some work done at Purdue, looking at um, fungicides for different air rats control. They looked at different combinations of triazoles and strobes and saw some results in some years, but in some years, the effect efficacy was low because um, the fungicide is not consistent in terms of um, getting, getting into that canopy and protecting those ears. So the, the fungicide, regardless of the air rats you're looking at, the same general question comes up in terms of getting that fungicide on the target. Yes, Miravis fungicides, we're working with Miravis right now. It does a good job of controlling head scabs. So we suspect that Miravis Neo, which is the Miravis version that's used in corn, might do a good job of controlling air rats. So we're doing trials now. My colleague, Damon Smith as Wisconsin did some trials last year, the year before, and saw some decent results with Miravis Ace, Miravis Neo. But again, the idea is making sure is getting that fungicide on those ears within that canopy to provide adequate protection of those silks. I see a question here about Zyway. I haven't looked at Zyway in terms of controlling um, air rats and vomitoxin. Zyway is often um, used uh, to control, FMC is promoting that as an inforal program to uh, control uh, leaf diseases with some results in some states. I've tested for three years in Ohio and this year I saw some benefit, but it's not very consistent, but I have not looked at it in terms of its use for control of vomitoxin in grain. We need to keep our eyes on air rats as well. Um, precipitation is a contributor, but um, you can have air rats with high relative humidity, even if you don't have actual you know, precipitation due to dew or, um, you know, so, Precipitation plays a major role, but as you can, as you see from my models, um, you can have air rats even if you don't have as much precipitation because high relative humidity can actually play that role. Precipitation works because it increases relative humidity and increases leaf wetness. Yeah, and that ties to the fact that we have more water vapor, higher water humidity vapor. In, in the atmosphere um, in general right now. And so that's what keeps the summertime temperatures warmer, a lot warmer than they were in the past. So that increased wetness duration and relative humidity is, is really important. Yep. It's unfortunate that, um, you know, on plant pathologist presentations are never, are never exciting. It's always sounds like the Grim Reaper or, or the Grinch, but you have to raise awareness. This is something we're seeing. And um, like I said, I really, really emphasize 
the importance of breeding and selecting for good resistant varieties. And it's something that has to be taken into consideration. We'll continue working hard to develop fungicide programs to help and use tools to help with decision making. But at the end of the day, emphasis has to be placed on resistance. And the only way we can raise awareness is by letting people know that this is increasing in severity and it continues to increase over the last several years. All right, it looks like that's it. So thank you guys very much for your time and the research that you're doing to help us you know, address this issue that we're seeing.